Hey guys, welcome back. Hope you're all doing well. So this is a brand new episode of SNES Life and this is a video where I'm going to be talking to you about everything that's been going on. So we're talking about gaming news, games I've been playing, talking about films, talking about new TV shows that I've really enjoyed. So there's quite a lot to get through and it's going to be a pretty lengthy video I think. So get comfortable, get a cup of tea and relax and enjoy. So yeah, first of all, I just want to of course, you know, explain where I've been, why I haven't been making videos. And if you follow me on Twitter, it's the only social media I actually use, at SNESTastic. The only reason I've not been on YouTube is because basically I lost interest and it happens to everyone. It is just one of those things. I've just really just been enjoying spending time away from YouTube, away from social media as much as I can. I haven't really been on Twitter as much as I used to be. I just dip in and out now and again. I've really just been enjoying watching films, going to cinema, playing games and yeah just doing all the stuff I used to do before I did YouTube so yeah I apologize for not making a video but realistically I ain't making videos unless I actually want to make a video and I feel the need to make a video and I just got to a point where I just thought I don't really have anything to offer anymore I had a great run I've done my time and I really appreciate everybody watching my channel and supporting my channel the way they have but I just felt as though I didn't really have a place anymore because you know there's new people coming in that are doing what we used to do and that's great and that's fine the community's growing and it's evolving i'm not a collector anymore so i don't really have a role in that camp so i didn't really know what i was going to do and if i thought and i thought to myself i'm going to come back and i've discussed this a lot with people that i talk to regularly i just thought well you know if i'm going to come back and make videos i want to make videos at least regularly or semi-regularly i don't want to just make a video disappear for a few months like i've been doing and then make another one and disappear for a few months because it's not fair on you guys because at the end of the day, you want somebody who's going to make content for you to watch. So that is my intention. So I thought I, I'm better off doing videos now where I can just talk about things such as films I've seen, games I've been playing, uh, anything that's happening in the gaming news as well. I'd like to comment on that as well and make it more of a, a much... I know it's always been a vlog channel, but it was more really based around gameplays, pickups, the collecting side of things, which it won't be anymore because I don't do that. So that's really what my theory is. The idea is that if I'm going to continue, I'm going to continue and do more straight up vlogs and just talk to you guys directly. And, you know, any stories that come up in the gaming sphere, give my opinion on it as I've done in the past. And I thought it'd be really cool. But of course, this is SNES Life. So this is going to be everything. So we're going to start with some gaming news. We're going to say we're going to have some games we've been playing, talk about those. I'm going to talk about all the films I've watched since July when I made my last video, which is a lot of films. So that's going to be a long section. And of course, I've also decided I'm going to talk about TV shows because it's not something I talk about that often. I have mentioned a few over the years, but I've never really gone into them. And there's been a few new shows I've been watching that I've really enjoyed. So I thought I'd share those with you and hopefully it'll give you something to check out if you haven't already. So what I will do as well, guys, if you look down in the description of this video, there are timestamps. So anything you don't give a shit about, just skip forward and watch what you want to watch. There you go. Right, so let's crack on. First things first is the gaming news. And before I do that, I'm going to have some tea. Get and work me with all before we get into this. So there's three stories that have come up recently, which I found quite interesting. First one is one that everybody covered on YouTube, because uh, I do still watch gaming videos, and that was the PlayStation Classic. So I thought, you know what, stuff it. I'm going to put my two uh, pence in on this one, my two cents. Yeah. PlayStation Classic, I've got to be quite honest with you, I wasn't that interested, and I still not, I'm still, well, I'm really not interested now I've seen what it actually is, because I think it's a bit rushed. And it doesn't look to be a particularly great product, if I'm honest, especially at the price they're charging as well. And the reason I think that is because I look at the games that were announced, and like a lot of people, I don't personally think they represent PlayStation. I think, you know, objectively, if you're not looking at games that represent your favourite PlayStation games from the era, and you just look, you just think about games that actually represent PlayStation. They've got Tekken, they've got Tekken 3, so that's good. They've got Ridge Racer 4, which is great. I know you could argue they could put the first Ridge Racer, but for me, number four is great because it's the best one on the system. Metal Gear Solid, another fantastic uh, addition. And they've got Tashindon, which is a launch title, which is fair enough. But, you know, you think PlayStation, at least I do, and I think Tomb Raider, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro the Dragon, Metal Gear Solid, Tekken, Wipeout, you know, and, and there's many others as well, but those are like the big titles the ones that really screen like 1990s you know playstation era so i don't understand other than the fact that obviously licensing comes into this and therefore i think well why even bother making the product if you can't get the licenses or at least wait until you can 
somehow get the license in and pay for it and do it properly instead of just shoving this thing out the door which is what they seem to have done they seem to have basically gone oh nintendo's had a lot of success with the snes and there's mini so we'll just cobble this piece of shit together and throw it out the door and then people can buy it because people will because it's not aimed at us as we know it's not aimed at collectors it's not our aimed at hardcore gamers it's just aimed at really the general public who had a playstation when they were younger and want a bit of nostalgia but i don't really see that it gives you the nostalgia because some of the game choices are so bizarre i mean like you know that rainbow six game what the hell i don't get it why would you put that on there it wasn't a popular game at the time at least not where i grew up it wasn't it's quite a strange choice and you know i've looked at the interface it doesn't look particularly great they haven't made much of an effort the games themselves don't even display correctly and i knew they were going to look like shit on a modern telly because you plug a playstation into a modern tv it looks like a load of shit because they're designed for crt tvs so i hoped like many that they would have put the money and time and effort in to modernize the games up-res them to at least 720p you know at least make them look presentable but from what i've seen of the captures on ign and other channels they haven't even done that they're all in like little boxes. They're not even like four, three proper borders left and right. They're just boxes. And Metal Gear Solid looks atrocious. So yeah, very disappointed with that. Then of course, a lot of people complained initially that well, why haven't you got a dual shot controller or at least the analog controller? You don't need the rumble, but why haven't you got the analogs? And I was one of the people going, well, you don't need them because most PlayStation games, you know, a lot of people misremember the era, but most of the PlayStation games didn't need the analog sticks. There was only a couple of them that it was essential. One of being Metal Gear Solid. You cannot play Metal Gear Solid without analogs and get the full Metal Gear Solid experience. So to put that game on the console and not include a DualShock, oh sorry, I keep saying DualShock, I keep forgetting there's an analog without Rumble, but to not put an analog PlayStation controller in the box makes absolutely subtle sense. I don't understand it. Now, of course, Sony being Sony and like all these businesses and corporations, they probably will and they probably plan for this, we'll release a uh, PlayStation analog controller for like 60 quid or something stupid. <laughs> probably not that high, but you know, I mean, they're gonna put a dumb price on it, just so that you can get the authentic, as they will label it, the, the real authentic Metal Gear experience. It's, it's bollocks. I mean, to me, it just looks like a rushed piece of crap, basically, coming on the coattails of Nintendo, trying to be cool and trying to make a load of money. And they will make a ton of money and it will sell out when it comes out. And we know it'll be, a hard to get item that'll be on eBay for 500 quid each and all this bollocks. But you know, people need to stop being suckers and stop getting pulled into this crap. You know, Nintendo, I didn't really think much of the SNES Mini when I had it, it was okay, but at least they made the effort. The presentation's there, and Nintendo has the advantage that most of the great games on the systems, and there's in the SNES, are their own games that they made, so licensing isn't such an issue like it is with Sony. They have a much more difficult time with licensing. I mean, I read this morning, apparently, the, the um, you have to do a, a disc swap. So I assume that's like use different images instead of it just being a complete game. That's bullshit. You know, when you're playing like Final Fantasy and so that's going to drive people insane. I don't see the logic in that. Apparently a lot of the games now are only running at 50 hertz PAL. So the NTSC gamers are going to have an issue with that because they ain't going to play like they did when they were kids. It just seems very half-assed and very rushed. And basically, I mean, there's people questioning even if Sony have actually made this or if they farmed it out to a third party, which wouldn't surprise me at all. If they just give it to some company and just knocked it out. Because it just, to me, it does not scream PlayStation nostalgia, which is what it's supposed to do. So I think it's crap myself. I think it's just a cash grab and, uh, yeah, it's shite. There you go. That's my two cents. I've been dying to get that out for a while. <laughs> Next up, no PlayStation related item. I'm not going to shit on PlayStation, but, you know, because I don't have a problem. I'm not biased. Despite that, I'm not biased. Honest. Can you get the other one? All that. But no. <laughs> I'm not an, an, a hardcore Xbox guy. Used to be. You know, I like all PS3, you know what I mean? Great console. But PlayStation, yeah, Sony's skipping E3 2019, so what does that mean? It's interesting to see them do that with the PlayStation 5 on the horizon. But, uh, but then I also, <laughs> I look at like this year, 2018's E3. Sony's conference was shite. I mean, Microsoft absolutely went gangbusters, and it was just... You know, for Microsoft, it was really good because they can be very corporate and stiff when they do their presentations. But this year's was absolutely superb. They nailed it. Whereas PlayStation, it went back to the days of PS3 where they're up their own arse and they think that they're superior to everyone else. And look how we lead and how great we are. And then, ha, 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 you peasants, that kind of bullshit. And I'm like, oh, come on. And then all that shit with the flute and all that. And it's like, and all the sets. It's like, you don't need all this crap. You don't need Sean Layden talking bollocks in stupid interviews. Just get on with it. 
show us the games. You know, you ain't got no new games, so just show us some new CG trailers for your games, and we'll enjoy that. And we got the Last of Us 2 one, which was fantastic, and Ghost of Tsushima, fantastic. You know, there are some great games coming to PlayStation, some great games out now. The PlayStation 4 is a phenomenal console. I just think that ugh, they cocked it up this year. And there's no PlayStation experience this year as well. So they're skipping PlayStation experience this year. They're skipping E3 next year. It's really interesting. It's a shame because it feels, obviously we just had the Xbox uh, personal conference normal, their version of the PlayStation experience. So it does feel as though everyone is doing a Nintendo now. We're going to have three separate events instead of having E3. Which for me personally, it sucks because that is my second Christmas. I love E3. I really look forward to June and you know spending all night getting the snacks in, getting huddled down, watching Jeff Keighley's build up to it and then watching the press conferences and the aftermath and the, the conversations and the interviews and all the great stuff and the speculation and the you know all the rumours if they come true. And I love all of that. It's fantastic. E3 is a fantastic week. So if E3 does go away, it's going to really suck. You know, it'd be nice if we still got the free events that we'll have Nintendo's Direct, we'll have an Xbox event, a PlayStation event, great. But I really would prefer to just have E3 because it's just the best. But yeah, it's a real shame we're not going to be there next year. But then again, I don't suppose gaming-wise they have a lot to show really because they are gearing up for PS5. And, you know, a lot of the games that they've announced, I would assume, like Ghost of Tsushima and Last of Us 2 and that, they're going to end up being cross plat generation again and so they're going to look better on PS5 but they're going to look absolutely stunning on PS4 so I don't really think there'll be a massive leap unless I'm surprised we'll wait and see but yeah it's a shame but there you go at least we've got Xbox next year hey <laughs> and speaking of Xbox there's a story going around at the moment that apparently the Xbox One S is going to have a discless version released shortly which is a fascinating concept because I've always been against digital. I've always been anal um, analog. I've always been physical media guy. Actually, no, if you watch my channel for a while, I love my physical media. I made a video years ago giving the finger to digital downloads because I thought it was the death of the industry and I hate digital. And in honest, to be totally honest with you, in the last few months, I've really started to come around to digital a bit more. I've tried the Xbox backwards compatibility. It's brilliant. It works a treat. Uh, the download speeds, I've got a decent download speed, so the games come down pretty quickly. I've downloaded um, Call of Duty 2 for the Xbox 360 because it's a phenomenal game. I don't own a 360 and I have to have it. And I downloaded Black for the original Xbox. Both run absolutely perfectly, superb, really smooth, exactly how I'd expect them to. Very impressed with the backwards compatibility. I did the trial for the, um, what's the bloody thing called there? Game Pass. I tried that. Great service, I think it's 10 quid a month and you just get a ton of games to choose from. For me though it doesn't work because it gives me too much choice and I found that I was downloading like five games and dipping in and out instead of playing one game and then playing another game. So I don't, I won't be getting on board with Game Pass even though I think it's a fantastic deal and if you're able to cope with it then it's great. But for me, I like to buy a game, complete it and play another game when it comes to modern stuff. I don't, it's just far too much choice with Game Pass. But I think Microsoft are making really good decisions and really great strides in that respect. So the discless system that's, that's possibly coming out, I'm kind of thinking it's a good idea. I'm surprised they're doing it this early because obviously all the rumours about the next Xbox, codenamed Scarlet, is there's going to be a discless digital version and a physical media console. And I, I assume they were doing that to test the water and to see how ready people are for digital media. And obviously if the digital console sold more, they would know to move forward with that going you know, with any new consoles they bought out. So it's interesting to see them jump straight in now with the current Xbox One S and to make that a discless system, if the rumour is true, of course. And yeah, I think, you know, if you've got the broadband speed, you don't have any caps, because these are still problems that people around the world have. I have a decent speed, so I can download pretty well. I don't have any caps. I've got unlimited fibre. So it's actually quite good. And I like... From doing a bit of digital download, and I've enjoyed the um, accessibility. Like Alex Blue Tonic Seventy Eight has always said, as much as it's a lazy thing to to not want to just go and get a disc and put it in the machine, it's just nice to pick the controller, hold the button down, boot the console up, bang you straight into a game. It's great. I don't like the fact that I ain't got any games and I've got nothing on my shelf because I like. To, it's not about shelf collecting. I just like having physical media. I like the touch of the physical media, the fact that I can play a game whenever I want to. I don't need to ever worry about it disappearing off my system or my system crashing or it not being available in the library or whatever reason, you know, you know it goes with digital stuff. But the convenience factor is a fantastic one. And I honestly think the discless Xbox One S 
might do quite well and it will definitely give them an idea of what to expect. And I'm wondering if maybe they are doing that because they're thinking about doing it with Scarlet, but they figured, well, we'll just put a discless Xbox One S out to test the water. We'll know for definite then if it's worth doing it for the next Xbox. It's interesting. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to get down yet because I say a lot of people have got caps on their systems. They've got slow internet speeds. So it's, it's, it's yeah, I think it'll be good. I think it's a good idea. I feel as though Microsoft are really making some strides now and they're actually pushing the right direction because Xbox has been on a down all this generation, really. Obviously, since 2013 when it was announced, obviously a lot of people were unhappy with the system and everyone jumped ship to PlayStation. PS4 has just skyrocketed and been a phenomenal success. And you know, under Phil Spencer now, they're trying to bring Xbox back on track, which is great because Xbox is a fantastic console, fantastic brand. I really like the Xbox One. I don't like the bloody installs, so a pain in the ass. But the actual console is fantastic, and I love the controller, and yeah, it's great, and it's a beautiful looking system. So that's it, really, guys. That's all I can think of recently that I've, I've seen in the news that was really interesting to me, and I thought, you know, I'm going to give you my two cents. I need to talk about those. So next up, I'm going to talk about some games I've been playing now. I've been playing a lot of games. I've been replaying a lot of games on Xbox and PlayStation, Xbox One, PS3, and I've also been playing an Xbox original game recently, which I'm currently playing at the moment, actually. I was playing it last night. And I'm right close to the end, so I'll talk about that last. But in terms of Xbox One, and yeah, I've just basically been, let me just grab them, been going through a lot of the games I used to play, that I've played before. And there's a lot of stuff I've got to find out what's on Xbox, because this generation, I found that I just keep playing the same games instead of buying new games. And so at the moment, there's games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and of course, Red Dead Redemption 8, and I won Red Dead Redemption 2, but they're too expensive, I can't afford them, so I've got to buy them next year. Uh, also, Christmas is around the corner, so I can't risk it in case Santa brings me one of them. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he will, but you never know. Anyway, so I've been playing a bit of the, some of the old games. So I've been playing Watch Dogs again, which is about like, the third or fourth time I've played through Watch Dogs. Uh, I absolutely love Watch Dogs. It's great. I mean, I know it got slated quite a bit at the time. When it, I think it came out like 2013. I think it was like one of the early games, wasn't it? It might have been 2014, actually, because consoles came out in like, November 2013. But yeah, I, I really enjoy Watch Dogs. I think this, the first one is way better than the second one. I've tried the second one a few times. Can't get on with it at all. Don't like it. First one, I really like the story. I like Aiden Pierce as a character. I think he's really good. Geordie's fantastic, obviously. I mean, he doesn't get enough to do in the game. I felt that he could have had a bigger role. Cause a brilliant character. And I've really enjoyed the gunplay in this game. It's the one thing that really stood out for me with Watch Dogs. The driving's a bit wonky, but the gunplay is fantastic. The battles, because the AI is actually pretty reasonable. And they do flank you and chase you down and don't just sit behind cars and barriers and just shoot at you. And I have a ton of fun with it every time. I think Watch Dogs fantastic. Uh, next one is an absolutely brilliant game, the 2013 Tomb Raider, the Definitive Edition. Enough said about this. I've played this game too many times to count now. I've played it on Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. Uh, I've played it more than 10 times across all those platforms, and I continue to play it to this day. Every now and again, if I need something to play and I've got nothing new to play, pop on Tomb Raider. It's brilliant. Not a big fan of Rise. I've tried playing Rise a few times. I've completed it once. I've got close to the end a couple of times and I just got bored. I just, I don't know, Rise just, it starts off really well and then it just gets really boring near the end and it just gets like, eh, I don't care. Whereas the first Tomb Raider game they brought out, it's just great. It's action packed. It's fun. Great storyline. Uh, Lava's really good in it. The whole origin thing that they build up with her and Roth. I really enjoy it. I think it's a cracking game. Uh, the newest of the, these games, which is not that new, is Gears of War 4. So I played this, well, I had an Xbox One a long time ago, and then I sold it and bought a PS4, and then the PS4 went and I got back on Xbox. So I bought Gears of War 4 to finish it because I've got, um, I think I've got like 60% through it. Uh, I really enjoyed it actually. It's a really, really good game. I've always enjoyed the Gears games. I enjoyed 1, 2, and 3. I never played Judgment. I have been told by Lloyd's, um, with the shred that the, it's actually a load of shit and I shouldn't bother with it so thanks for that Lloyd <laughs> I won't bother playing that one but yeah number four is really good man the graphics are absolutely gorgeous it plays like all the others it's a lot of fun and then weirdly left me with a cliffhanger at the end I thought it's it's like a bloody film or TV show it just goes poof, black and I was like oh so that's interesting because obviously seeing what's coming up in Gears of War 5 it makes sense in terms of the female character whose name I can't remember but yeah I, was, I had a ton of fun with it it was a really really good game so Looking forward to the next one. Um, I went back and I played Call of Duty Ghosts, which is great, man. I haven't played it for a few years. It's definitely one of my favourite. I mean, it came out 
on PS3 and Xbox 360. This was a cross-gen game. But like in the last, like I don't know, when what year did that come out? I don't know what year it was, like 2013, 14. So say the last four years. Uh, it's one of my favourite Call of Duties, actually, of all. All of the Call of Duties have been released. It's a fantastic game. I really, really like the story of Ghosts. I thought it was well done. Uh, the level design was fantastic. It was slower paced than most Call of Duties. You're not getting constantly bombarded by twats, and you can actually get through it and survive. Really, really, really fun game. Uh, yeah, love Ghosts. Then I went and played Battlefield Hardline again because I couldn't remember what it was like. I know I liked it, but I couldn't remember how it played. And yeah, it's all actually it's pretty good. I mean, if you don't know what it is, it's a cop version of Battlefield. So it's it's um, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's decent. <laughs> So then after that, I've also been playing a few PS3 games. Now, of course, PS3 games at the moment, like 360, are absolutely dirt cheap. Uh, Music Magpie knocks them out for a quid or two each, which is fantastic. So I've been picking up a few, and you know, I, I got rid of my PS3 ages ago, and then I bought one back, uh, which is not unusual for me, obviously. And I've been picking up games now and again, playing a few, buying some more, buying a few, buying some more. And so I'm just going to go through, quickly nip through a lot of these, because a lot of these people know the old... Uh, one I've played recently, which has really surprised me, I haven't played this since it came out, and I believe this was a launch title from what I can remember, uh, Ridge Racer 7. Now, I played, at the time, I remember playing Ridge Racer 7, and I played Ridge Racer 6 on the Xbox 360. I thought Ridge 6 was alright, but it was a bit slow. It was a bit stiff compared to other Ridge Racers. Ridge 7 is very much, I mean, I played it the other day, it's absolutely gorgeous. Considering it came out in 2007, I'm amazed how good it looks, it's beautiful. Uh, the soundtrack's really good, really hardcore dance soundtrack. It plays exceptionally well. The drifting feels really natural and good. Uh, it feels to me like a, a console version of the PSP game Ridge Racers, which was one that I got super addicted to when I got my original Japanese PSP back in the day and imported it. Um, I absolutely love that game. So yeah, if you're a big Ridge Racer fan, I'd highly recommend checking out Ridge Racer 7, or if you've just not played it for a while, go back and play it. It's brilliant. Then I played Medal of Honor Tier 1, Medal of Honor Warfighter, which, if you know me, is not unusual because I play them all the time. I've played them both 10 times plus each, and I've never gotten bored of them. I think they're fantastic games. They're seriously underrated for last gen because everyone talks about COD and Battlefield, and the press basically shit all over Medal of Honor. And yeah, the first one has got a lot of bugs. Number two's got a few bugs, but not like number one. But they are fantastic games. I really love Tier 1 and Warfighter, and I've grown to actually like Warfighter more than Tier 1 because while Tier 1 has a good story, it's great, fun to play, and it's, it's some fantastic level design. I felt Warfighter was better because you've got the same characters, but you get a much more in-depth story, and you really get to feel a bond with these characters. And by the end of the game, I can't spoil the story as to what happens, but something really tragic happens. And every time I play the game, and I've played it more than 10 times now, and it gets me every time. It just gets me right in, in that gut, man. My heart's just like, damn. And it's really, really good the way they've done it. Really well acted. And the story's great, and I absolutely love the level design. I have so much fun playing through that game every time. Uh, definitely, if you've never played those two Medal of Honor, please do. They are absolute gems. Then I went and played back and played an amazing open world game, Sleeping Dogs, which is just incredible. I completed this about two weeks ago. Uh, I love this game. I've played this a few times now. Bloody fantastic. If you've never played that one, I highly recommend that one. It's really, really good. I'd say open world set in Hong Kong, you're an undercover detective. And you're trying to take down, is it the triad? I think it's the triad. And yeah, it would be the triad because it's China. Uh, yeah, really, really cool. Third person, you know, GTA style. So you're running around, running and gunning a few times, racing cars, doing little missions, you know, spying on people and stuff. Fantastic. Really, really great title. It's also available on PS4 and Xbox One as the definitive edition as well. And uh, then I played Metal, uh, Metal Gear, Jesus Christ. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. Yeah, Modern Warfare 3, number one, absolutely brilliant. Call of Duty is fast paced, uh, really great storyline. And then I actually went back and played Black Ops 2. Not played this since it came out. And I was really surprised how good it was, and I enjoyed that. And that's a more futuristic one. But it's it's gorgeous to look at and plays exceptionally. I mean, Call of Duty is a sem they're pretty much similar, but you know, they are fun. Then I played 007 Bloodstone, which again I've played about 25 times now. I'm always playing Bloodstone, one of my favourite Bond games of all time. The car sections are bloody awful and they're really frustrating and some of them go on for far too long, like the Tuk Tuk part. But the cover shooting is absolutely spot on. Uh, it's extremely fun. I wish they'd just done that and not done the car bits, but there you go. And then the one, well, I'll go on first. 
I played the uh, 007 Quantum of Solace as well, which is a really fun game. It's a weird one from Treyarch. It's a combo of third person cover shooter slash first person shooter. Really, really good. It's not really Quantum of Solace. They have a little bit of Quantum of Solace, but because the film is shy and there's no story, they basically do a flashback and he talk and Bonds does a flashback talking about what happened in Casino Way Out. So 90% of the game is Casino Way Out because it's, there's more to work with. Um, it's brilliant. If you've never played it, definitely recommend it. Also, the PS2 game, which is a totally different game. It's a third-person cover shooter. Another great game. And recently, I've been started playing this 50, 50 Cent Bulletproof, which I have played in the past a few times. Definitely an underrated gem of a game. Uh, it's a third-person action game, just like... Is it, no, Blood on the Sand, sorry. Computer. It's like Bulletproof on the PS2 and Xbox original. Uh, Blood in the Sand is just a polished version, basically, in HD. Uh, it's a stupid storyline. He, he does a concert. He get, he's going to get paid with a diamond skull, but someone's nicked the diamond skull, so 50 Cent has to run around and grab this diamond skull. And in order to do it, you have to kill a lot of people, and you have 50s music playing in the background, and he says a lot of stupid shit. It sounds dumb, but it's a really, really fun action game. I mean, admittedly, if you don't like 50 Cent's music, maybe the music might piss you off and you might want to turn it off. I personally like 50 Cent's music. But, uh, yeah, really fun game. All right, so there you go. So that's the games I've been playing recently. And next we're gonna talk about films. So I've seen a lot of films recently. As I say, I haven't made a video since July, so it's been a while. So I'm really just gonna rattle through these because I think if I spend too much time, we're gonna be all afternoon. So the first film I saw was The First Purge, which is a prequel to the other Purge films. Uh, if you've never seen The Purge, basically The Purge is centered around the concept that um, this government are coming to power called the New Founding Fathers. They've implemented The Purge, which means that for 12 hours on one night of the year, they can, you can commit any crime you like, including murder. And it, you know, you're exempt. It's a really great concept. And the first one was more of a, um, home invasion film with Ethan Hawke and Lena Headey. Decent, I liked it. Second one was Purge Anarchy, which had, um, um, I just, it just blanked then. Frank Grillo, where he's on the street, he's trying to get to somebody who wants to take revenge for his son. I think I remember his son got killed, he wants to take vengeance. And on the way, he meets different characters and has to save them, and it's a fantastic one out in the city. Purge Anarchy is my absolute favourite. Third one was Election Year, which was dumb as rocks, but so much fun. And I absolutely adore that film. I know it's stupid. I know it's not the best one. But my God, I have a lot of fun watching that film. And then the, Purge and the, uh, the first Purge, as I say, is supposed to be a prequel. It's supposed to be about how the new founding fathers came to be, how the Purge came to be. But I'll be honest with you, I liked the film. I thought it was good. Not the best Purge film by any means. But the film really missed the mark. It, 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 I would have rather had a film where it was centered on the election of the new founding fathers and why people were going to vote for them and how they campaigned and and if the purge was part of that campaign instead it really was just a, a quick overview at the beginning new founding fathers in power we're going to have our first purge and then it just became a normal purge film and at the end of the film it became die hard which was quite bizarre but uh yeah it was it was all right it was a good film i had a lot of fun with it i enjoyed it nowhere near as good as the others and as i say purge anarchy for me is by far the best purge Next film was Skyscraper with The Rock. Uh, another die-hard film, basically. The Rock's got a leg missing. He was, he's a war vet. And I think he's an architect, if I remember right. It's been a while since I watched it. And he's asked to look at the tallest building in the world that's being built and to, to test its security. And his family's living there with him on the top floor. A load of terrorists break in, take over the building. He's got to rescue his family. Nothing original at all. It was a good film. It was. I felt like it was The Rock doing too many films working because he's the hardest man in show, working man in show business. And I felt like it was just a churned out film, really. It wasn't... I feel like because he's doing so many films that sometimes the level of quality can drop and Skyscraper was one of those. I enjoyed it. It was an okay film, but it's more of a Sunday afternoon. I've got nothing to watch. What's on Netflix? Oh, Skyscraper, that'll do. It's not a quality film at all. Then there was Mission Impossible Fallout, which was... Absolutely the opposite. A phenomenal film. Very long film. He's up at like two and a half hours or something ridiculous. This is like six Mission Impossible film. And I had so much fun with this film. It's absolutely brilliant. The stunts are incredible. The storyline's brilliant. The cast are brilliant. You know, what all this, the, the fascinating thing is obviously Tom Cruise, as we all know, does his own stunts. Everything you see is real. He's flying the helicopter for real. 
which was just absolutely incredible. He's jumping across buildings and he's doing all this stuff and you think, Jesus Christ, there's nothing this bloke can't do. He's amazing. Uh, yeah, I had a ton of fun. It's a really, really great action film. It's a great spy thriller. You know, there's twists, there's turns, there's great characters in it. Uh, yeah, Mission Impossible Fallout is phenomenal. And if you're a fan of the Mission Impossible franchise, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Then we had Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is the second Ant-Man film. And I've got to be quite honest with you, I wasn't as impressed with that. I thought it was okay. Not as good as the first film. And I think a lot of the sheen was taken away from me because Michael Peña's character was so funny in the first film. But his shtick sort of went away in the second film. I was like, eh, it's not as not as good as it was the first time, man, is it? Uh, it was just a, it was a very average Marvel film. You know, and you know, an average Marvel film is usually 10 times better than a lot of other films. But yes, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't one of my favourite Marvel films by any means. I still think the first Ant Man a lot better. But it's it's a decent film. I wouldn't say it was shit. It's not. Then we had the Meg, which was Jason Statham fighting a massive megalodon shark, which was actually a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Because I thought it might be a bit of a train wreck, even though I'm a Statham fan. But actually, yeah, I thought the the, the shark CG was pretty damn good. Um, it's it's very much like um, oh, what's that film called now? The, the Sam Jackson one with the, and Alan Cool J with the Sharks. I can never remember the name of it. I'll put it on the screen if I remember what it was called. But yeah, it was like that one from years ago. Basically, they're in a little base underwater. There's a bloody big shark going around. They've got to stop the shark. Um, it's not exactly like brain taxing in any way, but it's a fun fun little film. And, you know, if you like Jason Statham, like I do, I'm a massive fan. Give it a shot. Then the next one was Equalizer 2 with Denzel and Antoine Fuqua back directing, which was fantastic. Big fan of the first Equalizer, I loved it. Second one has been criticised because it's quite slow and there's not enough action, which I found out because the first one didn't have all that much action in. It was more story driven, but whatever. Uh, I really, really, really enjoyed this film a lot. It is extremely slow. Very, um, You have to stick with it and really pay attention to what's going on. And it's very much story driven and character driven. It is not about him running around gunning people down at all. Uh, there's a sequence at the end which was really cool in a, in a storm where he's picking people off, which was absolutely superb. And really the film is about him and the bond between him, between Robert McCall and a young kid. And I've absolutely loved Equalizer 2. It's one of my favorite films I've watched this year. And I'd definitely recommend watching it. Denzel, Denzel's fantastic. He always is. Next one I watched was The Nun. Oh man, this was a disappointment. Uh, before I saw The Nun, because I don't watch horror films usually, I'm trying to test myself lately, watch a few more horror films and sort of make the effort to just see if I can get into them because ever since I've been a kid I've been terrified of horror films so I won't watch them. I, I watched like psychological stuff like the Saw, like not the, the gory Saw, like the first Saw, but I won't watch anything where they cut people up and I can't have none of that. And I've always been scared of watching slasher flicks and that. I've watched the screen films but they're comedy. So I, I decided to watch The Conjuring with my dad to see if it would be any good. I watched the first two Conjurings, I thought they were absolutely brilliant, I loved them. Watched the two Annabelle films, thought the first one was okay, second one was bloody brilliant, really good. And then I thought, oh, I can't wait to see the nun. The, nun, the way they set the nun up in the country looked great, it's going to be fantastic. It was shit. It was a real massive disappointment. It was nowhere near as good as the country and the Annabelle films. It was just a thrown together mess, really. It was really hammy, schlocky. Um, it was bad. I did not enjoy it one little bit. Uh, it's a real shame. And it was not scary at all. And there's, obviously, in this cinema, I think there's like, probably like four or five of us in there, there wasn't a lot. And there's a couple of old ones behind me getting absolutely terrified by it. And I'm like, this is not scary. And I'm someone who can't stand horror. I'm someone who, in the cinema, when they do jump scares, I'm the one that jumps out of my seat. But it just did nothing for me at all. It was a really piss poor film and it's a shame. Uh, I can't remember what her name is. Like. Is it Tassia Farmiga? Vera Farmiga's sister? She plays the, the lead role. And she's brilliant in it. And even the bloke, I don't know his name, Spanish bloke, he's pretty decent in it as well. But the film's crap, so I wouldn't recommend the nun, the nun whatsoever. I'd only recommend the nun if you've not seen it and you've watched the Conjuring and Annabelle films, and uh, just just to watch it and make your own opinion. But it's not a good film. Then I watched a really cool film with Jennifer Garner called Peppermint, which is absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed this film way more than I actually expected to enjoy it. Uh, Peppermint, basically the synopsis: it's a revenge flick. Jennifer Garner's husband and son are killed by gangbangers. Uh, her her husband is going to do a job with a mate. They're going to rip off some drug dealers. And he pulls out at the last minute, but the drug dealers don't know he's he decided not to do it. And they, they torture his mate, and then they kill him and the kid. And then Jennifer Garner just goes off on one, trains herself, and you know becomes like an MMA fighter and all this. 
and becomes proficient in firearms. And she comes back to Los Angeles and just murders everyone. Uh, it's it's fantastic. It's a really good film. Jennifer Garner is an incredible actress, and I knew she'd be good in this because she was the actress in my favourite TV show of all time, Alias, where she plays Sydney Bristow, and she's a total badass in that. So I knew she'd kick ass in this film. So yeah, I would highly, highly, highly recommend watching Peppermint. It is bloody brilliant. Then there was Venom um, with Tom Hardy. It's all right. <laughs> it wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was just, eh, it's all right. It's worth watching. Um, it's a very old school comic book film. Not like what you get nowadays. Um, there's some good jokes in it. Venom was well done. The CG was decent. Uh, Tom Hardy was really good in the role as he always is, but... The film was very average. It was just, yeah, it's okay. I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was shy like the critics. I didn't think it was the best thing I've ever seen. It was just an okay film. Then I saw the new Halloween film, which I absolutely loved. Uh, I've never seen the original. As I say, I've never been a fan of slash flicks and horror films. It's not my genre. But I really, really enjoyed the Halloween film. I thought it was fantastic. I love the, the music and the, the, the little musical cues, which... I've now seen the original, so I know that they're taken from the original. And it had the whole 70s vibe to it. I, lo I love the way that Michael stalks his victims and like little things like the way you see him walk down the side of buildings while there's a victim in the house and they don't know he's coming. Uh, it's brilliant. It's really good. I had a lot of fun with it. The only thing that was dumb was the fact that he, he stomps on a blunt and crushes his head. And I thought, really? Come on now. Um, but the actual film was great. Um, I thought Michael was brilliant. I thought Jamie Lee Curtis was fantastic. The tension was great. I just I really enjoyed the whole the whole setup was just really, really fun. Great movie. I definitely recommend seeing that. And I did go back and watch the original 1970s film. And it's really interesting when you watch the original because this is supposed to have eradicated all of the sequels that came afterwards. And this is a direct sequel. So you go from the first one to the new, the new 2018 Halloween. And they use the same music and the same musical cues, which is all right. But it felt more like a homage when you've watched the original instead of being a straight sequel where they should have really used a different soundtrack, I think. Uh, you can have notes, obviously, of the original, but I think they should have really changed it. But nonetheless, it works well. The first one is funny as hell to watch now because obviously not seeing it at the time, it doesn't have the impact that it had when it came out and when people grew up with it. And it's it's just so 70s. You know, you've got people smoking everywhere. Every time a woman's killed, she has to have her boobs out. It's like, really? Does she really? When he strangles the one girl with the phone cord and she's got a top off, I'm like, was that really necessary? <laughs> but, you know, 70s times. I find it quite funny more than anything. Uh, some of the acting is diabolical. The, the, the actual dialogue for some of the characters is atrocious. Uh, the fact that Michael's just standing in the middle of the street in the daylight with his mask on and his boiler suit and no one takes any notice. It was, it was like, okay, I know it's Halloween, but it's still daytime. So <laughs> it's like, whatever. Uh, but I, I, that's not to say I didn't enjoy the first film. I actually thought it was really good. Um, the only thing I didn't explain, and maybe they do in the sequel, they didn't explain why he's invincible, because it seems like you can shoot him, stab him, smack him over the edge, you can chop his bloody arm off and he'll still come back. Even in the new one, you know, and they leave it open at the end that he's obviously not dead and he's going to come back for more. And there is talks to make a sequel, which is brilliant. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed the new Halloween. It's a fantastic film. Really, really good. And then the latest film I've seen was a couple of weeks ago, I went to see Widows which is the new, um, what's his name again? I knew that was going to happen, Steve McQueen, the guy that made 12 Years a Slave. So I knew it was going to be good because 12 Years a Slave is an incredible film. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this one. Basically what it is, a group of uh, men, including um, Liam Neeson and a few other actors, they rip off a, 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 a geezer. I can't tell you too much because I'm going to spoil it. It's only just come out. They basically do a job. They rip someone off with a load of money and then they die. And then the widows are left and the widows owe this money to this person. And so they have to come together in order to survive and they have to do a job. The last job that Liam Neeson had planned in his book. Uh, it's really, really good. It's slower paced. It's character driven. Uh, some fantastic performances from uh, Viola Davis and also from Colin Fowle, who's fantastic. And Liam Neeson's great. He doesn't have a lot to do, but he's great. Uh, there's a really cool little twist, a Mission Impossible twist, the uh, 96 original Mission Impossible twist. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was really, really gripped by the film all the way through. Some interesting camera work and all, which I thought was at first a bit odd. And then I realised what they were doing. I thought, that's pretty cool, actually. Uh, it's a really good narrative on, on society as well and the, the disparities between the rich and the poor. And it's an excellent film. I would highly recommend Widows, guys. Brilliant stuff. Bloody hell, I'm talking a lot on this one, aren't I? Right, have we got any tea left? Yes, I have. Okay, 
And the last thing I'm going to talk about is some TV shows. Now, there's been a few new TV shows this year that I've started watching, so I thought I'd pick the ones that are new, because that way they're only in the first season, so if you haven't watched any of them and you're interested, it's going to be a lot easier to just jump straight in and give them a watch instead of watching something that's been on for multiple seasons. So the first one is God Friended Me. Now, this is not a show I'd ever normally watch. It's very um, family-orientated, very nice show. But it's a really good concept, and it works. It's really, really fun to watch, and it, it makes you feel good at the end of the episode. Now, God Friended Me, what it is, is basically this guy, Miles, runs a podcast called The Millennial Prophet. He's an atheist, and his father's a priest. So there's an, obviously a, a, a conflict there between the two of them, uh, which is keeping them apart. And because he's an atheist... Uh, he does this Millennial Prophet podcast to preach that basically God doesn't exist. And what happens, he gets a friend request from God. And he keeps ignoring it because he thinks it's ridiculous. It can't be God. It's not real. Uh, but it just keeps coming until he eventually accepts the friend request. And as soon as he accepts the friend request, what happens then is he gets friend suggestions from God. And the first one he gets in the first episode, which is in the trailer for the show if you watch it, he's, he gets this guy. He has to track him down. He finds him on a train station on the subway and he's about to commit suicide and Miles grabs him and stops him committing suicide. And then later in the episode, he's given another friend request for a girl called Kara, who he, when he finds her, he's dying on the, on, the, on the street. And he screams out for a doctor and this guy steps forward as a doctor and it's the guy you saved earlier in the film, um, in the show. So basically, that's it's all about interconnection um, and, you know, and faith, obviously. And... You know, the good of humanity. It's a really, really good show. And each week he's given a new friend request while his friend Rakesh, who's a hacker, who's trying to figure out who's behind the God account. And, you know, because obviously that, being an atheist, Miles does not want to believe that he actually is God. He believes that someone's playing a game. But as the episodes have gone on, he's met more and more people and helped more and more people. And he's, I think he's starting to slightly change his views now. And it's bringing him and his father together as a, um, again, which is a great thing. It's a, Brilliant show. It really shouldn't be a good show, but it's actually a lot of fun. I don't know if it'll get a second season, but absolutely recommend God Friending Me. It's a really fun little show. Uh, next one is one that could possibly get cancelled, I think. We'll wait and see, but there's a good chance of it. And that's Magnum P.I., the reboot. of you, you, People of my age group will remember the original Tom Selleck Magnum, which was a great show. Uh, this one is it's uh, Jay Hernandez, I think, if I remember, is the guy playing Magnum. And he's basically the same thing. He's in Hawaii, which means they get to do crossovers with my favourite show, Hawaii Five-O, which is fantastic. So far, we've only had a couple of cameos from ancillary characters. We haven't had Steve and Danny or Dano, because obviously that'll come in second season if they get one, which I don't think they will. I've got a feeling it's going to get canned, we'll see. Uh, it's pretty good so far. It's, there's been an up and down with the episodes. There's been some decent ones, some okay ones. Last week's episode, episode nine, was the best one they've done, I felt. It was really, really good. Um, yeah, it hasn't really found its feet yet. I mean, I, I can't remember. It's been that long since Hawaii Five-0 started, how that fell in the first season. But I'm pretty much sure it's been consistently good. I mean, I love Hawaii Five-0. It's one of the best shows on TV. Um, yeah, but if it, I hope Magnum gets a second season because I'd like to see it continue and to see what they can do with it. And it'd be good because they can do more cameos and crossovers with Hawaii Five-0 as well. So, but um, yeah, so far it's been a bit bit middle of the road but i'd still recommend giving it a try if you're interested uh then we've got manifest which is the big show at the moment the big like lost type show it's sort of like lost coupled with 4400 if you remember that show basically what happens is a family's on a on a holiday trip um the, they're about to get on the plane the message is over the tannoy that the, the the if people want to take a later flight They'll pay them some money. So some of the families, some some of the family members decide to take the later flight. And what happens is the plane takes off. They eventually land and they find out that actually they've been they've been missing for five years and no one knows where the plane went and where the people went. But to them, they just had a bit of turbulence in the air and they've landed. Uh, it's it's really good. It's it's really interesting. As I say, it is like lost. It is like the forty four hundred. So. There's like they're coming back now and they're finding that they're getting this voice in their head which is leading them to different things to help people and save people. And there's the whole mystery of the plane where it went, is it the government that was involved? Was there some kind of experiment? It's really good. And it's it's you know, if you're if you're looking for another show like Lost where you don't know what the hell's gonna be around the corner and there's loads of mystery and intrigue, then Manifest is definitely one to check out because I'm having a lot of fun with that one. They have got an annoying child character, unfortunately, like a lot of shows have, which, you know, is either gonna be have an annoying as hell or I'm going to be okay but I'm not too sure yet the kid's kind of pissing me off a little bit but we'll see how it goes but Manifest is a good show then we've got FBI from Dick Wolf which is 
the guy that does the Chicago program, Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, and my absolute favourite, Chicago PD, which is an incredible cop show. I'm a sucker for cop shows, military shows, FBI shows, anything like that. I watch them all. Uh, my other favourite is Blue Bloods, which is spot on. Great show. Uh, FBI is really good. It's got Missy Peregrine, I think that's how you say it. I'm not 100% sure. She used to be in Rocky Blue, which I believe is a Canadian cop show, which I used to like as well. And uh, I don't know the name of the male actor, but there's basically a female and a male FBI agent, and they have to solve crimes every week. Uh, I know it sounds a bit like X Files, doesn't it? But it's not. It's uh, really if you know Dick Wolf's work, it's really serious, gritty, dark, moody, quite depressing, and uh, you know it shows you the darker side of life. And the music's always really heavy. Same as Chicago PD. You feel like you need to watch after watch Chicago PD because it's so bloody dark, <laughs> but it's still a great show. But yeah, I've really enjoyed FBI so far. I've had some fantastic storylines. I had a great storyline with a sniper, which that was superb. Um, and last week they got double crossed. And yeah, I'm really, really enjoying it actually. I think FBI is one of the best new shows out there at the moment. And they're pushing it quite a lot as well. Then they got The Rookie with Nathan Fillion, which is basically a middle aged man having a crisis and decides to join the LAPD. And apparently it's based on a true story as well. So Nathan Fillion's the middle-aged man. And he, instead, I thought he was going to just focus on his character, but he doesn't. It focuses on him and two other rookies. One's a female that he's dating, and the other one is a young kid who comes from a dad who's really well-respected in the police. And he's got a lot on his shoulders to you know, to perform. And it's really good. And basically, at the moment, it's the rookies going out with the TOs and trying to learn the terrain and what to do, what not to do, how to react. And it's, it's actually pretty good, actually. It's quite a decent little show so far. And they do lots of really cool stuff with the body cams and all where the camera flips between the normal camera and the body cam. Um, yeah, recommend it. Rocky's really good. And the last one is by far my favourite new show and I, my favourite comic book show at the moment as well. My favourite show, comic book show was Arrow, but this one's taken over, and that is DC's Titans. And I absolutely love this show. Now, I know, I'll preface this by saying I've never read a comic book, DC, Marvel, whatever, so I have no preconceptions whatsoever of the characters that I'm given and the storylines. And I know a lot of people who are hardcore comic fans aren't particularly happy with Titans because it's dark, it's gritty, it's violent. There's a lot of adult swearing and language. Um, it's extremely violent, actually. <laughs> and a lot of the characters, some of the characters aren't the way they are in the comic books. And the usual thing you get a lot with the films. But for me, as a non-comic book reader, I absolutely love this show. I think it's fantastic. It centers around Robin or Dick Grayson. And basically, what has happened so far is that Dick Grayson was a, a member of the Flying Graysons, which was a circus act. His parents have died. He's taken under the wing of Bruce Wayne, Batman, obviously. And it's the, the program starts with him as a cop. I think he's in Chicago. It's Chicago or Detroit. I can't really remember, actually, off the top of my head. But he's a copper. He's left Robin behind. He's got all this baggage from Batman, and he resents Bruce Wayne for the way that he raised uh, Dick. And he doesn't like putting the Robin outfit on because when he puts Robin on, he basically loses his loses the plot and he, he becomes a man that he doesn't want to be and he'll beat the shit out of people, literally. I mean, the violence is unreal. Um, but I absolutely love it. I love the darkness. It's like Zack Snyder's universe, basically. It's gritty as hell, only it's darker than Zack Snyder. I mean, basically, Robin curb stomps people. He gets their face and grinds it across a wall, push them, pushes them through uh, cut glass. You know, you meet there's other characters such as uh, Rachel. Apparently, she's called Raven. She's got a demon inside her. He's protecting her. Then there's uh, Starfire, who's woken up. She's got Russian gangsters after her. She's got no idea what's going on or who she is, where she is. She just realizes she's got this power. She can fire, fire basically, and blow stuff up. They've got another character called Gar, who's Beast Boy, and he's a member of the Doom Patrol, which they've got their show coming next year. And they've done an episode where they meet Gar. And you meet the Doom Patrol. It looked really interesting. So I'm fascinated by that. Can't wait to watch that show. And in episode two, you have Dove, uh, Hawk and Dove. who are absolutely brilliant. Dove, I love Dove. I want a figure of Dove, you know, like them, because she looks absolutely incredible. But the violence, man, there's the one bit when uh, Robin has to save Hawk and Dove when they get caught. And he's got on his chest, he's got the R on his chest, which is like a batarang, but it's in a tiny little batarang in the shape of an R. And he's throwing his arms around, stabbing up people. And if, when he's finished beating the shit out of him and breaking bones, he walks over and saves Hawk and Dove. And he, there's a bloke on the floor with an R just sticking out of his eye. And Robin just reaches down, pulls it out of his eye and sticks it back on his chest with the blood dripping down. It's vicious, man. I mean, they don't hold any punches whatsoever. Uh, there's, there's loads of swearing. There's loads of adult themes. 
as I say, Robin Curb stomps people. Uh, <laughs> they don't hold back whatsoever, and I've absolutely loved it. And they also introduced the new Robin as well, which I won't spoil it. I mean, obviously, if you've read comics, you know who it's going to be, and you've probably seen it online. But yeah, I absolutely love Titans. It's bloody brilliant. Best comic book show on TV after Arrow. After Arrow, yeah, because Arrow was my favourite. Now this is my favourite. And next year, we've got a few more coming from DC, which I'm looking forward to because I don't know anything about these characters. We've got Doom Patrol, which as I say, I did one episode of Titans and showed them. That was really cool. We've got Swamp Thing, which is coming. looks really good. There's one called Stargirl, which I know nothing about. It's bloody brilliant, man. DC is killing it on TV at the moment. Um, and for me personally, I'd argue they killed it on the films. A lot of people disagree because they think they're shit. I think they're brilliant. Justice League was a bit ropey, but I still like it. <laughs> but yeah, the Aquaman in two weeks. Woohoo! Can't wait. I'm so bloody excited for that film. Brilliant. Anyway, guys, there you go. That's it. That's everything that's been happening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Snares Life. And I really just wanted to share everything with you. And as I say, if you've not seen any of those films, check them out because you might like them. Check out the TV shows. There's some great shows there. Um, yeah, fantastic. I don't know what I haven't done. I've just realised one last thing before I do go. So the, the game I'm currently playing at the moment on the original Xbox is Nightfire, 007 Nightfire. And yeah, I'm really thoroughly enjoying this game. I've never given it a time of day to play it all the way through. And I'm finally doing that. I've got about two stages left to go. Uh, it's a fantastic first person shooter, gorgeous graphics, really nice on the Xbox. Controls really well as well because you can change the controls and the one control is the one I've, I've, I've found the right control system for me where you can use both sticks like you would a modern game where you use the right stick for camera, left stick to move forward, backwards, left and right strafing. Uh, it's fantastic. The only thing I found that really pissed me off, I was really doing well with the game and it's great. And then it suddenly got to this stage where you're underwater in a car. It drove me absolutely insane. I must have tried it like 20 times to get through this stage. I eventually did it yesterday. Oh, so frustrating. I got really annoyed with it. And then after that, you get even more vehicle levels. And I was like, oh, for God's sake. Um, you have to drive a truck and that drove me nuts. And then you get to fly around the head in a plane, but you don't control the plane, you just control the guns and shoot shit, which was great. Uh, and now I'm on a first person shooter level. So I've got two levels left, I think. And yeah, it's bloody brilliant. So I've just ordered a couple more Bond games for the Xbox. So I'm going to play through those as well. Uh, really, really enjoying Nightfire. Really enjoying my Xbox because the original Xbox is a great console. There you go, guys. Well, well, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy these Snow's Lives. I know a lot of you do. Uh, please leave your comments down below as usual, of course. Let me know your thoughts on the films, the TV shows, the games, the news stories. Just uh, let me know what's going on with you guys. It's been a while. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.